Um, Praveen can lead us in an opening prayer, Praveen, and then uh, over to Sachin after that. Let's pray. Father, we are in your presence with the attitude of gratitude, Lord, for being with us and leading us guide, and guiding us throughout 2022. And uh, thank you so very much for the successful Bible studies we had. And uh, we could learn so much and grow in your grace and knowledge, O oh Lord. Thank you so very much for being with our pastor and all the speaking team, helping us to understand and grow in faith, O oh God. And uh, as we come to the end, Lord, I pray and ask for your guidance and leading for the year that is ahead of us also. And this moment, as we're going to meditate on your word, especially as Sachin is going to uh, take us through the New Testament survey, or, or survey God, I pray your spirit's uh, <clears throat> empowerment may be granted to him and speak to us so that we may be able to perceive and receive your truth that you are going to reveal through your servant. And the time we spend in discussion may bring glory to your name and bring mutual edification to us, Lord. Thank you very much for listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Praveen. Yeah. It's been a blessing to be the part of the Bible study series. Uh, I uh, didn't had much of a chance to fellowship because the project I am supporting nowadays, it's work. Uh, three hours delay so this is the very afternoon for them so sometime i am unable to uh, join but i guess shanti represented us and she keep updating uh, how it is going and uh, give me a moment i see uh, mr vincent chan a very belated birthday and pastor javed welcome good and a very good evening it's good to good see evening. you after a long time yeah <laughs> Yeah, Bertie, are you able to hear? Yes, I can hear now. Oh, great. So let me share my screen. We'll start. Can't hear. Not loud enough. Uh, wait. Let me increase the volume. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, great. Give me a moment. I'll set up my screen. Hey, it's visible. Still not loud enough, Pastor Sachin. <clears throat> I did my best, Bertie. One second, let me audio setting my microphone. Okay, now it should be loud enough. It's at the loudest now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great. So, yeah, thank uh, you. Well, lovely, lovely. So let's start our, uh, our study into the New Testament survey. And last week we have seen uh, the uh, Jewish history, that is Judaism in the first century. Let's have a quick recap on uh, what we did last week and then we'll continue with our subject this week. So we saw the four branches of Judaism. We saw Pharisees, we saw Sadducees who mainly used to look after the temple duties. We saw Essenes who used to live mostly uh, uh, outside the cities in, in the group. We saw Zealots who the group which was very uh, violent used to uh, believe in violent activities. Then we had a brief uh, view on the belief and we saw that religion was more a matter of what a person did not what they believed. So the more focus was on doing rather than whom they are doing. Then we also saw apocalyptic theology in which we saw some of the Jews, instead of hoping that the things would slowly improve, they thought the end should come and have a dramatic cataclysm. That is a cataclysm, that is a violent end and God takes over everything. Then we saw also how the worship uh, was there in the first century, which was the rituals in the temple and synagogue services. 
So today we'll be covering what is gospel and we'll also in that what is gospel we'll try to see what um, literature it belongs to, uh, what genre it is, why it is called as a gospel, uh, how many gospels are there and then we will also see synoptic gospels. So today, uh, okay, so now if some ancient librarian come across the book, the gospel according to Mark, how would this book be classified? Would it be placed with histories, with the saying of the sages, or would it be stored with the stories of gods? Now, the author, Richard Burge, author of What Are the Gospel, he says the closest genre would be the Greek bio or the lives of famous people. Now, Greek and Latin authors sometimes wrote character sketches of orators, uh, philosophers and national leaders. Now, these were not biographics in the modern sense because there was no effort spent on to explain their childhood, how their childhood experiences contributed or shaped them as a person. Here, the focus on what was the person like as an adult, it is somewhat like an eulogy. Now, another author, Warren Cotter, the author of Matthew, storyteller, interpreter and evangelist, he writes that the ancient biographies had somewhat different convention about content and functions than modern biographies. Ancient biographies do not attempt a comprehensive detailed presentation. They do not engage in psychological analysis of the inner motivations. Actions reveal character. These biographies focus on the typical and they have a very clear teaching function. And you see the gospel fits into this pattern. It focuses on one person. It focuses on his deeds to show what he was like. If he has wise sayings along with the way or interaction with God, that's okay. It's a part of the story. But a librarian would not see this thing as the focus of the story. Rather, the focus of the story is on a person and what we what he did and what he said. Again, uh, the author uh, Venham and Walton, they say the focus of the gospel is Jesus, the subject of the life. Now, this might sound blindingly obvious. But for much of the last hundred years, the heart of gospel scholarship has been in examining the communities that are supposed to be behind the gospel rather than the, their true subject. Who were they, what, how things happened, what exactly the chronology, what they believed. But more recent scholarship, such as the work of uh, N.T. Wright, Marcus Bogue and Scott McKnight, has begun to reverse the trend and to follow what Burge led by studying Jesus whom the gospel presents. And that's why we can all call the four gospel as ancient biographies. Now this gives them a label, but a label by itself does not help much. The important question is, what is the significance of this genre? What standard of accuracy would an ancient reader would expect from such a, such a literature? You know, now the standard of accuracy uh, expectation apparently varied a very good deal. However, most reader would expect the book to focus on what a person was like, not on a chronology. They would focus on person. Now these events saying we are supposed to be genuine but reader understood that the similar anecdote might be grouped together, even though they would have happened several years apart. Now, they would expect an accurate representation of what the person was like, but not a detailed timeline. When it happened, how it happened. They wouldn't really care whether uh, Jesus healed a lame man before expelling a demon or vice versa. The exact sequence 
wasn't important for their purposes. It was not. Now, according to uh, Isibias, the, the church history and Papias, the an early second uh, century bishop in Asia Minor, they describe one way the gospel was written, for example, the gospel of Mark. Now he says, Mark, who had been Peter's interpreter, wrote down carefully, but not in order, all the and what all that he had remembered of the Lord saying and doing. Now Peter used to adapt his teaching to the occasion without making a systematic arrangement of the Lord's saying. So that Mark was quite justified in writing down something just as he has remembered them. In other words, Peter told various stories about Jesus, but he wasn't trying to put them in a precise order. Now he had a sermon on one topic one week and a sermon on another topic another week. Mark gathered those stories and organized them with only a rough idea of the chronological framework to put them in. Now, for example, let me give it. Although Jesus had probably several trips between Galilee and Judea, but Mark saw no reason to dwell on that. He may not have been sure about the details anyway. So he grouped the events in Galilee together, events in Judea, and then the crucifixion. Now we'll talk more about the organization of a lecture, like organization of book of Matthew, Luke and John, because they all have a different organizational scheme. And hence the sequence make it very difficult for us to assume exactly what happens when in the exact chronological order. So it's about what, who Jesus was, what he did, but not exactly when he did. Yeah. So let's move to the next aspect. What was the purpose? Why did Mark write? Why he felt a need to write? And there are probably three reasons. First is to preserve the stories. To preserve the stories after Peter died, it is not known whether Mark wrote after Peter died or merely that he could see that people Peter was likely to be killed. He was not sure. And to preserve the story after Mark died, possibly he uh, would have also seen that he might get killed too. Now the stories are worth preserving for two reasons and they were for evangelism and discipleship. Now they were useful in bringing people together to faith and were useful in teaching people who already believed. Second aspect why Mark uh, wrote is probably to share the stories with people in other places. Now, Mark could have seen that if persecution become severe in Rome, it would be good to have stories preserved in different places like Gold, Sicily, uh, Dalmatia, and as many places as possible. It would be unlikely that persecution would occur all the places at once. And besides, the believers in those places would probably benefit from the written stories too. So Mark attempt to organize the story suggests that he was thinking for a wider distribution. And the third uh, aspect would be to provide a moral example. Now that was the normal function of Greek bio. People were supposed to imitate the main character of the book because people's actions spoke as loud as their words. Now, we do not have direct evidence of Mark's purpose uh, why he wrote, but we have a evidence of the result. And that is Mark book was known in many areas in the early years of Christianity. It was found useful and it was authoritative. So the next aspect is how did it come to call to be called the gospel? One second, I just need to, yeah, okay. So, first of all, because Mark uses this word in his introduction, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, he expects that his readers to already know the word. He may have used it as a title to his book, or he may have simply begun his book by describing the message of Jesus with the term Evangelion. Now, the 
Eon, E U A N G E L I O N, and I'll put that on the screen soon. Now, the term would be familiar in two ways. First is that, okay, yeah, yeah. First, it had a Jewish background. That means in the Greek version of Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 7, the word, um, which one, Eon Jillian, is used as the announcement of the coming of God's reign. And this is what John and Jesus were proclaiming as well. Second was, in the Greek Roman world, the word Eon Jillian was used for announcement about the emperor. The root word means a good message. So, otherwise Mark's book would have suggested to the reader something like this. The beginning of the announcement of God's salvation and reign taught by Jesus in fulfillment of what prophet Isaiah promised. Amazing, right? Now, whether Mark gave his book a formal title, we do not know. But eventually the word gospel came to use as a designation, not just for this book, but for several other books that were described what Jesus did and taught. They came to be designated by their author, like right? the gospel according to Mark, the gospel according to Luke, etc. Then the main question come, how many gospels? Yeah. Now, soon there were four gospels and in the next century, there were even more. For example, the Gnostic gospel of Thomas was written in the last half of the second century. And then the Gospel of Peter and others came later. Some of these Gospels had unorthodox doctrines. So the church leaders such as Irenaeus argued that four were the correct number. That's because these four were already in widespread use by the Orthodox churches. Now when this topic came, uh, I wanted to learn about it. Why only four and how many books do we have the correct book? And I found a very beautiful article and I wanted to cover that today. But I read first paragraph, I moved to second paragraph and I forgot the first paragraph. Then I realized that I need to dwell a lot because the whole uh, document consists of people's um, finding based on some assumption. So in the future, I will definitely bring this one to the another Bible study with the subject, do we have the right books in the Bible? But that's for the later day. Today it will der derail our, um, our discussion. So now comes the synoptic question. The first three gospels are similar to one another in structures, story and terminology. These three gospels are called as synoptic, which means roughly seen together. They are looking at the life and teaching of Jesus from a similar perspective. But have you ever imagined why are they so similar? In the scholarly world, the question is called as the synoptic problem. And one answer to that is they are describing the same thing and the Holy Spirit caused them to be similar. But then, the next question to ask, why didn't the Holy Spirit inspire them to be identical? Wouldn't one inspired account be enough? And why did the Spirit inspire John to be so different than the three gospel? Possibly because the Spirit worked in and through human being working in the culture of the times. The inspired writing use an imperfect language and sometimes the unusual grammar because the spirit was working through the literary, literary capabilities of the writers. Now let me give you one uh, illustration. If you ask one uh, episode of the Bible to be written by Pastor Dan, Praveen or me, you would see the same matter in a very different way portrayed. The same story but portrayed totally different by the three individuals. It could be because the way one is used to writing, second, the other is perceiving, third, how the Holy Spirit is guiding, fourth, how 
each of us are grammatically uh, the, the way we understand the language our proficiency so things differ but at the same time message is same that's how holy spirit inspired those writers now luke tells us that he did some research and this is the most plausible explanation for the similarity we find in the synoptic gospel that is somebody copied from somebody else now when we compare the synoptic gospel we see often the word after word is very identical because aramic was probably used in the first telling of the stories that is uh, speaking and listening even if the aramic story became standardized at an early stage it is doubtful that several people would translate it into greek with nearly identical words it's not possible there are just too many translation options for different translations to be that similar for example let me give you some illustration mark chapter 1 verse 2 quotes the old testament in the form that is different from both the hebrew and the greek version whereas matthew chapter 3 verse 3 has it just like what mark has put it only suggests that one copied from another so that means we can now conclude that the story was standardized in greek and further that it was most likely be done in the written form now there are just too many people who could have told the story in aramic and that too many people would have translated it orally for an oral story to be standardized but you would see both matthew and mark have a comment for the reader in the exact same place like for example in matthew chapter 24 verse 15 and mark chapter 13 verse 14 they have the same comic exactly at the same place it is likely that one copied from another luke says he used written sources which we he mentioned it in luke chapter 1 verse 1 to 4 now it is likely that others did too hebrew and the greek versions now matthew chapter 3 verses 3 has it just like mark which only seems that one copied from another luke says he has written sources and same now a supporting observation is that most of the stories are told in the same sequence if the story had simply circulated uh, as stories it is likely that they could have combined into many different sequences right but the basic order is same in matthew mark and luke so what difference this makes to us and what what difference if one has copied from other one has exactly the same what it means first that it means that if something has been changed the author may have a reason for it that's the first thing we need to understand if one author has changed something there can there is a possible reason for it if different words are used there's likely a reason why those words are used and if the second writer makes a change we probably need to ask why because then these changes can alert us to what the author was trying to achieve then we can put ourselves into their shoes and see how they are seeing to what they have wrote and that is why for us it is important to see these differences then the next question comes is who wrote it first yeah so so the synop synoptic problem soon develop into the question who wrote first did matthew write first and mark abbreviate it and luke edit it with the help of mark or did mark write first then matthew and luke expand it in different ways or is luke the earliest gospel and then matthew edited it and then mark abbreviate the result with three different book there are theoretically lot of possibilities and then i have put uh, not i have i have taken it from the internet the venn diagram the venn diagram that shows about how the each um, gospel has i believe you have a big screen otherwise i'll try and read from it so how you can see is you can see the gospel of mark matthew luke you can see mark has about 661 verses only 5% is unique to mark that is 31 verses 
out of that 171 verses are in both math mark and matthew but they are not in luke similarly you will see that about 326 verses have parallel in all the three synoptic gospel matthew mark luke similarly if you see matthew he has 168 1068 verses only 300 are unique to him and about 250 verses are in luke and matthew but they are not in mark yeah now on top of that if you see john has parallel to about only 10 percent of the synoptics primarily in the segment of the story of jesus betrayal death and resurrection but when john tells the same story he often does it with a different vocabulary and then you will see only three and a half percent of the words are same with john and the synoptic gospels now how did the similarities happen now uh, we are not aware of anyone who suggests luke was first a few scholars say that matthew was first but most say that mark was first and there are several reasons for it let's see one by one because mark is much shorter there isn't much of a need for a shorter gospel correct if there are other gospel before that available we don't need a shorter gospel as craig uh, blomberg says why would mark have written it at all if he had so many so little to say new and further evidence that Mark has was widely neglected in the early church. There's no need to remove the stories of Jesus birth, the Sermon on the Mount and a lot of other teachings that were present in other um, gospel, but not in Mark. Mark is shorter and that's why perhaps Mark is the first. The second is Mark, the gospel of Mark is wordier, which means if one wants to make a shorter gospel, then there is no need to modify the stories to use more words. For example, the Mark, now the Greek version of um, the Gospel of Mark, he shares uh, the stories which is usually the longest that you will see this, this story in Math, um, Mark chapter 10, verse 22 to 31. It's covered in almost 171 words in Greek. The same story in Matthew, which is covered in Matthew chapter 19, 23 to 30, has only 154 words. And Luke, on the other hand, the same story covering in Luke chapter 18 from verse 24 to 30, he has only 120 words. So to claim that Mark was producing an artist account is not really true. He tells fewer stories, but he tells the individual stories at a greater length. The the third aspect was Mark Greek was a bit rough. What does that mean? If he were to modify Matthew, it is hard to explain why he would make a grammar little clumsy to what Matthew has written first. And he would add Aramic a word uh, like Talitha Kom, which means little girl get up. For his Greek speaking reading, readers, he is adding an Aramic word. And if he has to copy from Matthew, it doesn't make sense, correct? The fourth one is Mark liked to use ger, which is the meaning for. For it is to, like to introduce a clause or an explanation. He does that 34 times, whereas Matthew does it only 10 times in all the material he shared with Mark. Now, this is easy to explain if Matthew is copying from Mark. He took it and he only used it where he felt appropriate. But if Mark is copying from Matthew, it is very odd that he is uh, adding this um, uh, for uh, to the additional verses. Now, the next one is some of the Matthew's quotation from the Old Testament are similar to the Septuagint, which is a Greek version of the Hebrew Bible and others are not right. Whereas Mark uses only clothes that are close to Septuagint. Matthew taking similar to Septuagint and Mark chose only the Septuagint. Now this is e easily explained if Matthew copied from Mark, that means he took the Septuagint and then added the similar to it, correct? Then the next one is Mark has a hard saying, he is very vocal. 
Mark make the disciple look more stupid and he make Jesus look less powerful. For example, in Mark chapter 6 verses 5 says that Jesus was unable to do miracles in Nazareth. Now Matthew says simply that he didn't do any miracle. Mark says that Jesus was indignant with the disciple. Matthew doesn't say that. Now it is more likely that Matthew would have softened the tone. And Mark was quite sharp about it. The general consensus is that Mark most likely wrote first. Matthew edited his stories, tidying up the grammar, removing the unnecessary wordiness and adding many more teaching. But if that's the case, then the next question comes to us is, but why would Matthew, who, is an, who was an eyewitness, use a book by Mark, who wasn't the eyewitness? And possibly two reasons for the same. Because Matthew thought Mark's general framework is usable and there is no need to invent another framework. It is easier to edit Mark uh, than to short start from the scratch. Besides, the stories were really from Peter. So there is no need to eliminate them. That's the first uh, reason. The second reason is it is possible that Matthew didn't actually write this book. It was put together by someone else based on the stories Matthew had told. Just as Mark has put together uh, based on the stories Peter told. Now this person found Mark, felt that Mark did not include enough. So he edited Mark based on what Matthew had told uh, the same stories. Plus he added a lot of material that is unique to Matthew. And in the title of the book, he gave credit to Matthew as the source of the stories. That's the this. So as we reach towards the summary of our today's this thing, we can see that the four gospel can be categorized into ancient biographies. That is number one. We saw then the biographies to focus on what the person was like, not on the chronologies. Then we have seen the purpose of writing the gospel. We have seen because Mark wanted to share the stories for evangelism and discipleship. Then we have seen how these biographies are called gospel. How the word gospel came into these books, the title into these books. Then we saw synoptic gospel, which means roughly seen together the three gospel. Because they are looking at the life and teaching of Jesus from a similar perspective. Then we saw who wrote it first and the similarity between the three gospel. Matthew, Mark and Luke. So the next, uh, now having known what is gospel and synoptic gospel, now in the next session we will go into the gospel of Mark. How he wrote it? What was the theological uh, view behind it? What was the circumstances? What is unique to Mark and so on, so forth. But for today, before we go into our uh, question Q&A, I would like to put forth this question. We'll discuss and then we'll take the Q&A. Now, this is the first uh, session, but as you would read, uh, as we would go together, journey together, the New Testament survey, you will see that as these gospels are written by individual using their literary capabilities, that is the language, proficiency, fluency, grammar, we will see, soon see that the writer's view in quoting the story the way they did, why they did, and why the uh, different authors have used different way. Now, my question is, will this change our view of how we read the scriptures? Because now we are going to see why particular verse was kept, why particular word was omitted, what was the view behind it. Now having seen this, will our view of a scripture change? And why I am asking this question? Because there is a background to it. The, the local church pastor, he is a, a, a dean, he was a dean of the Union Biblical Seminary that uh, used to be in my hometown, Yavatmal, now it's in Pune. 
it's a major Christian college which gives both uh, the degrees and he said many students after going through the the uh, Old Testament survey and the New Testament survey, many have had a difficult question on their faith because they start to see the book or the gospel or the epistle, the letters from the author's perspective rather than seeing it from God's perspective. Because we all know every word is influenced and by the wisdom of God through the Holy Spirit has come to pass. Though the writers have different way of writing, but the story hasn't changed. No one has changed the story. No one has developed the story. And that's why I want to ask that as we we'll progress further, when we see these realities, will our view of seeing the scripture change or will it remain same? Over to you all. Sachin, can I just clarify something? Yes. Uh, when you ask the question, will your view of scripture change? Are you meaning that, uh, are you saying that it is now less believable and will affect our faith? Or are you asking, will uh, it add to my understanding and knowledge by uh, reading the various gospels? I just wanted to ask you, what did you mean by that question of Change. Intent both by because as we see the reality how the things were written, will the revelation help our understanding of the scripture by the Holy Spirit and it will take us to the deeper revelation or we will see and we will say, ah, ah, I used to think this is merely by the view of John or this is merely a view of Mark, uh, it doesn't make sense. Okay. how it would be right i feel that uh, um, it only adds to our understanding when you read uh, when you talk about synoptic gospel all the three it adds various perspectives now very interesting you mentioned this example of uh, mark quote i mean to say mark recounting the story of jesus not being able to do miracles but Matthew says he didn't do any miracles. To me, it seemed, uh, you know, it seemed to just clarify that it is not that Jesus can't do miracles. Uh, you know, nobody can tie his hands, uh, you know, or nobody can do anything to, uh, to remove the power of Jesus to do miracles. So to me, it clarifies that perhaps Jesus was not willing to do miracles and Matthew is very helpful there. So I don't know if I'm making sense, but uh, I feel that uh, it only adds, the stories only add and gives us a fuller picture. I'll wait for others and then we can share our own. I believe Praveen, we also talked much before, <laughs> long, long before when I was taking this course. Oh, the same. Yes, Mr. Poppins. You will have to unmute your mic, please. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, sir, now can you hear me? Okay. Sir, I would like to second what our lead pastor said. Uh, the, if you study all the four Gospels, the basic meaning or the big, basic purpose is valid, 100% valid, verifiable, testable, and, and uh, confirmed. That's, that's what I wanted to add to what our pastor said. Thank you. You'd like to add, Praveen? I think you can now.
the four gospels in the scripture are uh, they present uh, jesus in uh, four unique uh, present a way uh, and approaches to look at the life of jesus and uh, one of the interesting thing we find is uh, these four gospels they present Jesus according to the title which the entire New Testament and Old Testament was talking about, that is Messiah. He is the Messiah, the one who was uh, most awaited uh, by Israelites. And all. The moment we talk about Messiah, it reveals few things. Number one, the Messiah is the promised Messiah, the king who is going to rule and he is going to be the son of God. And he's going to be the son of man. And according to Isaiah, he's going to suffer. Uh, and uh, he's going to establish his kingdom. And these are these are the four themes uh, of the title Messiah we find from entire Old Testament. And at the same time, if you read the four Gospels, Matthew presents Jesus as the promised Messiah King. Mark presents Jesus as the suffering servant. And in other words, he's a son of man. And Luke, sorry, son of uh, suffering servant, and Luke presents Jesus as son of man, which is talking more for he speaks more about uh, the incarnation and all. And then John comes and he speaks entirely uh, the divinity part of Jesus, and he speaks about Jesus as the son of God. So from Genesis till the Revelation, if you read, all the prophecies are talking about uh, one particular person, uh, the Messiah the anointed one who is going to accomplish this his messiah ministry in these four aspects and all those four aspects were brought together in the four gospels and have presented to us i believe that is the reason that is one of the reasons this is just my thought okay one of the reasons we didn't have another fifth gospel god knows what is required and uh, all these theological the uh, threads god brought together and not them together in the gospels so that's something I look at. Correct. When we see what the author is portraying, then we'll see what he is portraying. Now for Matthew, he is the promised Messiah, the king, right? He didn't felt it necessary to show that his king was unable to do that. He, he didn't felt for his uh, listen, uh, readers to be probably be get into this a debate or thought process so he simply didn't cover it that is why when we go through the book we need to know who has written from who were the audiences okay what was the the situation but one more thing i would like to add is the book is only not for that time or that this thing it does apply to us and that is why it is here so we then need to see how god is revealing that text to us in our current uh, circumstances so that's why i wanted to ask that we as we go through it should only enhance and multiply our understanding it should not reduce our understanding that was the thing now before we go into q a i have prepared uh, the, the answer for a question that pastor dan has asked us last week is about the jews which tribe they were in the first century uh, in judea and because there's a huge uh, thing we read about the lost 10 tribe. Yeah. So let me share my screen. We'll cover that and then we'll go into Q&A. Okay. There's a big answer. So I have put the points. I'll read and I'll add because they were just too big for me to remember until okay let's go into the who were the first century jews yeah now after the death of king solomon the north tribe of israel rejected king uh, Rehobo, uh, uh, rehoboam as their king the nine tribes formed the kingdom of israel there were the tribes of reuben Issachar, uh, zebulun dan neftali gad asher ephraim and manasseh now the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, they remain loyal to King Rehoboam and they stayed in the kingdom of Judah. In the year BC 721, in the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Hala and in Habor 
on the river of uh, Gozan and in the cities of the Medes, as we read in Second Kings chapter seventeen, verse six. These are the sequence of events, and we'll build our story. Then, along with the people uh, of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, some of the Levite stayed in Judah. Now, not all the uh, Levites went to Assyria. Some stayed back, and some of the Levites who went to uh, uh, Assyria, they came back because they wanted to seek the Lord God of Israel. And along with that, some of the people of the ten tribes of Israel also came back, as we read in Second Chronicles chapter eleven, verse sixteen. We also read in Second Chronicles chapter fifteen, verse nine to fifteen, that many of the tribes in Judah, that is, many of the tribes of Israel in Judah, joined King Asa when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. Then what happened? The king of Assyria took over Samaria and carried Israel away with Assyria. But remember that when this event happened, the this event in year BC seven twenty one, he didn't took each and every Israelite. He took the bulk of it. So some remained back, and similarly was the case when the Babylonians took the southern kingdom, that is the Judah and Benjamin. Some remained back. Okay, this is another fact to note down. Then what happened? So uh, in the meantime, uh, when after uh, Nebuchadnezzar overtook uh, Jerusalem in BC 588, the Babylonian Empire succeeded the Assyrian. Now that means the people, all the Assyrian land uh, was under Babylonian. Though we don't know the exact location of the exile of Southern Kingdom of Babylonian, you know there was three times captivity. Uh, the Babylonians took the Israel three times, but we read that Ezekiel, who was one of the ten thousand exiles carried off by Nebuchadnezzar with Jehoiachin by the river of uh, Chebar in the district of Gozan, which we read in the first slide, one of the very part where the exile of the ten tribes were also scattered, so they were also staying there. And it happened much before, when the Assyrian, uh, a century before, when the Assyrian took over uh, the Israelites, the Israel tribes. Now, with this captivity, now, the, now the captivity under Nebuchadnezzar have the people of Judah and the people of Israel. Now, what happened? Their rivalry ended, and they look forward to a national future. The one future is that is bound under the promise of the house of David. Now they came together. Now, when King Cyrus issued the decree for the Israelite to return the Jerusalem, remember for to building the temple, we read that the families, not tribes, returned. The families returned, and it's, hence it's very difficult to say how many were belonging to the tribes of Israel, that's the ten tribe, and how many belong to Judah. Then, yeah. So to summarize. The first century Jews in the Judea and Galilee consist of people from all the twelve tribes, and similarly was the composition in the diaspora, that is, the Jews who were staying outside Judea and Galilee. So, we it's the the, the speculation that only uh, two tribes were there um, was not. We had people from all the twelve tribe. In fact, some of the Babylonians, or some some of these is Israelite who married to the Babylonians, had children. They were also there. So that's the 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 answer, uh, Pastor Dan, that I could collect together and put together. Thank you, Sachin. I think that was uh, very well done. I mean, uh, uh, you you brought it into sequence. Uh, so. Uh, it 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 seemed to indicate that today um, the Jews or you know the people belong to Israel they will not be able to identify their tribe would they I mean will any modern Jew say I belong to the tribe of Dan or I belong to the tribe of Naphtali I don't think they can right uh, they are all completely mixed up <laughs> I had similar experience while working in Cameroon um, one of my colleague was uh, Israeli you know. 
So all this expectation, which tribe you belong to and how do you identify each other with the tribes? And I saw a very different modern picture. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Just wanted to mention that, you know, earlier in uh, our, our pre-reformation teaching was that uh, the uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, uh, you know, were the English speaking Anglo-Saxon people today. And uh, that was how we had taught. And I think uh, uh, we were uh, not accurate at all on that. And uh, we have found that we were mistaken in the way we preached or, or talked about the Anglo-Saxon English speaking nations being the descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh. And so that was an unfortunate, uh, you know, teaching that we perpetrated. This extract is from the same book, which was talking about uh, um, the Israel lineage in the America and England, uh, referred by Mike Morrison. But okay. I can just extract the information that we needed. It's right. huge. Right. Um, anybody have questions? <laughs> Any clarifications uh, needed? I just uh, would like to add a thought to what Sachin has closed with. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I mean, in continuation with what Sachin has already said, in continuation with that, but in the uh, early church, uh, sorry, in the Gospels, we find people are identifying themselves with certain tribes. Jesus was identified with his own tribe and uh, uh, Paul identified himself with his own tribe. So for a, for a period of time, uh, you know, it, uh, it, it, may, it helps us to think and believe that still the uh, genealogy was continued and Jewish people, they had this uh, uh, habit of writing the genealogy. So it might have been passed on to many others. And we do not know what happened after uh, uh, the 70 AD and when, when Jewish have to uh, Jewish people have to completely leave the nation almost for 2000 years uh, and spread to various parts of uh, uh, Europe and what happened and what is that we don't know. But, but even today, there are certain groups who are coming up in Israel and they wanted to uh, set up their uh, ancient traditions and uh, they were who wanted to start the sacrificial system again, they're identifying themselves with certain kind of uh, uh, tribes and all. But I, we, I do not know the genuinity in that. But still, there are people who are seeking, uh, trying to identify themselves with their, uh, their own uh, tribes. So we don't need to completely uh, get to a conclusion like Israel completely uh, lost whoever were living in Israel during the times of Jesus and even now they're not the Israelites at all. These are the extreme teachings we hear from people uh, who say uh, that the Israel which we are talking is not at all uh, the true Israel. So these are extreme teachings are coming, but still uh, after all these also even uh, scripture points us to uh, yeah, scripture points us uh, and give gives uh, a, a hint that in the last days God is going to ray, bring for one life forty four thousand of His uh, messengers from each tribe. So there is still there should be a connection which we may, may not be visible to us as of now, but still there can be a possibility for the connection to be continued. May I add something? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, so two things. One is, uh, you know, in the previous days, even in India, I'm sure it is the same in Pakistan, there used to be families who used to write genealogies of families, other families. They used to keep a record. Their whole uh, history of their, of a particular family was to note down other people's families. So I'm sure even in those times, they were like that. And a few families, they have their full family trees, linkages all noted down and a few did not do it. And so that is why only a few of the names have come up this way and where we get to know, okay, this person is from this tribe and a few I'm sure were lost somewhere in between. Uh, having said that, coming back to the topic of the Bible study this, this uh, evening, um, 
where the question of you know would you view it now a little differently for me uh, whether it was the synoptic gospels and the one non synoptic gospel that is that i'm sure we're going to speak about all the four of them despite them coming from different authors dif uh, different from uh, different authors from different family backgrounds from different educational experiences from different grammar and and language proficiency i find it amazing and even more a deeper understanding and an appreciation for the holy spirit that despite the times uh, also right the dates also were different in the uh, when it was when they were written that through it all the the in the bible it says i am the word i have been i am and i am to be that kind of shows and portrays portrays forward for me even more and i have a greater appreciation that the word doesn't change the word that has been inspired by the holy spirit never changes it could be because of human like you know niv may we always read the niv is not at all good because this is this this is that but then nevertheless even in that we can see that the holy spirit has inspired people to translate and write and somewhere down the line as long as we know that the word is the same you know in accordance with the holy spirit and his revelation you know two human beings i find it amazing that people were able to do like there are some languages in africa that people are still translating the bible now many people can give many other things but even throughout the times of the gospels i find it i just have a greater appreciation today thank you sachin for just bringing out this topic because how marvelous is the holy spirit that he could keep it there despite people of all types of backgrounds and in varieties throughout the world. today we have 8 billion nevertheless the holy spirit never changes he 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 is he was he is and he will be uh i want to add something can you hear me yeah go ahead javed yes, yes uh, as uh, sister was telling about the synoptic gospel so uh, i i would like to agree with her that holy spirit guided the uh, writers But naturally, when they write, Holy Spirit was not taking their finger and writing that. Holy Spirit inspired them, and then they use their words and they write it. And secondly, gospel is only one. There is one gospel. These are four testimonies. These are four testimony of one gospel. So God could have used all the twelve apostles He wanted, but God chose what He wanted who they should be writing. So He chose four people. for so this will be a testimony for one gospel so there is nothing change is naturally if all were going to write the same way then must the use of four people so these are four people telling the gospel in a different angle but gospel is same talking about jesus and what he did and what he said but doing jesus jesus in a four different angle so i think it's more inspiring than when we read clearly that there are actually uh, skeptic they want us to doubt <laughs> that skeptic want us to doubt but uh, the more they say the more we are, we don't doubt we rather are more strong in our faith i just want to add one thing and in continuation to that you see as the holy spirit led these four authors to write similarly uh, we are how many now uh, 3.6 a uh, billion right people across population of the world yes yeah uh, 8 billion now 8 billion 8 billion people with different grammatical understanding the same holy spirit which has enabled these authors to write is the same holy spirit which is revealing god through jesus so we don't have to sometime bother about our understanding of this particular this one because i see my father in law is still talking about the name of god shall we say or not they are still stuck there i said chalo aage badho <laughs> there is lot to be discussed i mean so you see that's the beauty of it so we don't have to put a onus on ourselves also am i in a understanding to and no let the holy spirit reveal he is the one who has revealed them to write he is the one who will reveal us and he is doing continuously that's the beauty of it well the time is just basically gone <laughs> uh we have uh, it's already 7:30 here so i don't know if anybody else has any comment to make yes franklin go ahead 
Uh, please unmute yourself, Frank, uh, Franklin. Yeah. Now, sir? Yes. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Pastor Praveen put, uh, put it very well, sir. He gave a synopsis of how Christ is presented in the Old Testament and how Christ is presented in the four Gospels. Okay. And even Pastor Javid uh, made excellent comments, just like Shanti Man. But now coming to the question, sir, why we have four Gospels? In the book of Matthew, the book Matthew presents Christ as king. Mark presents Christ as a servant. And uh, Luke presents Christ as a human being. Christ, uh, Luke is emphasizing the humanity of Christ. And uh, uh, the last uh, gospel, John, presents Christ as his divinity. So we have uh, king, the king, Matthew, presented as king. And then uh, we as a servant as a, uh, his humanity and his divinity. So all the four tie up very well. And then I have, I came across a very nice quotation. I remember some years back, I, I presented a, a message, why four gospels? I will share this particular quote, short quote on our fellowship. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Well, um, in, I was just wondering, maybe you can uh, think about it, Sachin and uh, uh, yeah. Would uh, uh, the Gospel of John, um, would it qualify to be the, the genre of it be biography or something else? Because he is more, he has more theology. And so I'm wondering whether it is a biographical or some other genre. So anyway, any, any comment on that? Uh, not now. Okay. But, uh... uh, everybody, uh, I, please allow me to go out. I have to attend another meeting. Uh, and thank you so much for everything. God bless you. Thank you for joining us, Shanti. God bless you. Again, uh, we note and we bring a little comprehensive answer. Uh, okay. Okay. All right. Then uh, what we'll do now is uh, we'll close. I just wanted to announce again that uh, this is the last Bible study for this uh, calendar year. Our next study will start on January the 4th, 2023. So we are going to take a break uh, and come back in the next uh, year, which will be, you know, four weeks from now. Franklin, could you lead us in a closing prayer? Thank you. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, can you hear me, please? Yes, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Gracious Lord, a loving Father in heaven, we so gratefully bow our heads, Lord, to give you thanks. Thank you, Lord for this opportunity to come here together on this platform and then to look into your subjects, Lord, afresh. Lord, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We are able to uh, listen to the perspectives, to the different perspectives, and we are able to form our own. And even as we do this, Lord, we want to thank you for all our pastors, our lead pastors, and all the other pastors and our guest pastor today. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you, Lord, for everyone whom you brought us. Lord, open our hearts and our minds to an understanding of your word. Because, Lord, in the ultimate analysis, spiritual truth is imparted only when you unlock our hearts and our minds. Give us a good understanding and help us, Lord, to grow in faith. And, Lord, help us to grow into a deeper relationship with you day by day, week by week. Fill us, Lord, with your love and maybe reflect your love in our everyday living at home, in the community, and to the world, even to the world outside. Thank you, Father. Bless all of us, Father. We thank you and we praise you and we give you honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen.